Hi friends, I'm Todd Robinson. I am the Executive Director of Next Step Recovery Ministries. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My objective here is to be a help and encouragement to you, no matter what you're struggling with. And we all have struggles, whether those struggles are addiction, mental health issues, emotional problems, maybe a family conflict. Whatever the problem is or whatever the challenge is, we want to add value to you and your life and your family. Thanks so much for joining us. So tonight is gonna to be kind of an introduction, okay? I'm gonna fly through some slides here. I forgot my clicker, so I apologize for that. But here's your agenda for the next few weeks, okay? Tonight, you're aware, introduction to emotions. Then next week, we'll go into sadness, depression, um, and then uh, happiness, anger, anxiety, worry. And then the last week, we'll talk about mental health issues and the church. Um, sometimes, it's kind of taboo for us to talk about mental health issues in the church. We kind of get that feeling sometimes, and then there's controversy sometimes around medication. What's the role of medication? Should we take medication? Uh, if you're a Christian and you struggle emotionally, does that mean you're a weak Christian? What does that mean? No, it means you're human. Who's human in here? Raise your hand if you're human. Okay. All of us have our issues. All of us have our emotional struggles, our mental struggles. So. How many of you have broken a limb before? Anybody broken an arm, broken a leg, broken a... Did you have to go to a doctor? Sometimes your brain gets broken. Your brain is a physical part of your body, just like your arm is a physical part of your body. But when the brain gets broken, it makes us act funny, right? Makes us think funny. And we're gonna talk about the relationship between the way uh, thinking affects the brain or does the brain affect thinking? And, and both occur, okay? Both occur in there. And we'll, we'll talk about the, the change in science a little bit and how that relates to, to the Bible. And I think we still got folks coming in. Come on in. We're going to go to a couple of examples in Scripture. We're going to look at Jesus. Jesus had an emotional crisis. We're going to look at that. Paul had an emotional crisis. We're going to look at that. We'll, we'll talk about some of that tonight when we, when we, when we kind of go through our introduction here. So, but these are, these are kind of what we're going to go through over the next few weeks. It doesn't mean we'll be limited to those topics. We may touch on other topics. So tonight in our introduction, we're going to kind of talk about what is, what are emotions? What does that mean? Okay. What chemicals in our body drive emotions? And then we'll look at those examples of, of Jesus and we'll look at the example of Paul tonight as well in our introduction. Remember, just kind of a broad overview tonight, right? So as we go into it, there's your little, you like that guy? I drew that. So next week we're going to have an art class. Yeah, you like that. Here, I get a, I, I don't know if any of you subscribe to Gallup. You know who Gallup is? Gallup, they do polling and they do research, right? And I got a, I got a, a big uh, research document the other day from Gallup called, uh, it was based on, uh, uh, the Gallup World Poll, based on emotions, based on how's the world feeling right now? How do you think the world is feeling right now? Twisted. Twisted. Emotionally, how do you think the world is feeling right now? It, 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 we're, we're at some of the worst times emotionally in the world than we've ever... Why do you think that is? What, what are we coming off of? Confusion. What is it? Confusion. Confusion, okay. Isolation. Isolation, COVID, the, the lockdowns, and all those good things. So if you look at this chart here, and it's kind of hard maybe to see, I gave, I gave you some handouts there, but this, is, this one's labeled the global rise of unhappiness. And don't get focused on what the number is. It's an algorithm, and it, they measure unhappiness around the world. And obviously, since 2006 to 2021, we've gone from a score of 24 to 33. It's kind of like the stock market. We're not real sure what those numbers mean. We just know up is good, down is bad. Well, here, up is bad and down is, is good. So we've seen a global rise in unhappiness over the last few years. And most of that, but you can see it starts well before what? Well before COVID, we start an upward trend. So it's not just COVID related, okay? Some of it's social media related. A lot of it is social. I attribute a lot of, a, we compare ourselves, we look at what other people are doing, and everybody puts on social media what? The best. The best, yeah, my best, right? For the most part. 
I, I can tell you right now, I've watched my kids' mood change based on what they saw on Facebook because they, her, their friends read a movie and they didn't get invited. And there's a picture of all their friends at a movie that they didn't get invited to. And all of a sudden they go from up here to, to down here. And, and, and that information, I say we're, we live in an information overload. We'll talk about that some too. We are in, we're, not designed to take all, we're not designed to take in all this information that we take all the time. The news used to be, used to get the news in the morning and the news at night and it was usually a day old by the time you got it. Now you're getting it what? And it's constantly changed. You're getting it all the time. And what's that do to your emotions? It just up and down and up and down. It's like watching the stock market 24 seven. It just drives you crazy. Don't do that, right? <laughs> you're pointing at, yeah, we're gonna start pointing at people, that's him, that's her. So, yeah, and a few more charts here that we're going to look at. Negative experience index. This is ex negative experiences that people are having, right? We see a large increase in that really over the last few years from a 24 up to a 33. There's some interesting ones up here I'll show you as well. These are the happiest countries in the world right now, all right? The happiest country in the world, the most positive experience country in the world is Panama. So if you want to be happy, Go to Panama, right? What do you think the, now this is the top, I don't know why it's the top 11, usually it's the top 10, but there's 11 countries up here. The top 11 happiest countries, South Africa, Denmark, Senegal, the Philippines, Iceland, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Paraguay, Indonesia, Panama. What do you think the most unhappy country in the world is? I, the United States isn't in any of the United States is like in the middle here, so they don't make any of these charts, okay? What, China? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Afghanistan has the yeah, it's on your it's on your handout there. Very good, Scott. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so your this is not Georgia, the state of Georgia. This is Georgia the country. Ukraine is up there at sixty. Afghanistan thirty two. Wow, what what's Afghanistan going through? It's tough. <laughs> Yeah, constant war, uh, oppression. Um, it's not a happy place to be. It's not a very happy place to be at all. So just, again, we're just kind of, this is just kind of informational for you as, as an introduction as to what we're talking about with emotions. The whole world is in an emotional crisis right now. And we experience those. We, we're not immune from that as, as Christians, as believers. We're not immune from this. We're not immune from the things that are going on in this world. How many of you live in the world? Anybody here actually live in the world? Okay, yeah, we live in the world. How many of you are on social media? We're all, you know, how many of you watch TV or watch the news? Yeah, I usually watch it and silence it. I put it, I put it on mute. And then, um, but we, we're, all, we're all vulnerable to all of this emotional turmoil that's going on in our world. How do we handle it? How do we deal with it? What drives the depression? What drives the anxiety? What, I had a conversation with one of my kids the other day and they were in a very anxious mood and they were very worried. And, I, and, and then after a while, I'm talking to her and, I, and, and, and I'm like, and she, and she makes a statement to me and I looked at her and I said, now I know why you're anxious and worried. You have been listening to X, Y, Z all day long. You know, and it's one of these um, influencers, right? That they like to, and I was like, yeah, I guess you are anxious. <laughs> what you've been listening to all day long is the end is coming. <laughs> Everything's falling apart. And, and, and so I said, you're going to I said, turn that stuff off. You've got to be disciplined. We've got to be disciplined in what we're allowing into our lives. It is good to take a break from social media. It's good to take a break from the television. It's good to take a break from the newspaper. I'm not saying we should be ignorant, but sometimes there's too much information that's flowing to us all the time. All right. So the psychology of emotion. So when I say psychology, don't 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 get freaked out. OK. <coughs> the very word psychology comes from the Bible. For knowledge, the word for knowledge, psychology, doctrine. Okay, so the original owner of psychology is who? Your Bible. 
Okay, so the, the problem is we cor we corrupt things in our we, we corrupt different things in our in our in our usage of words, and then all of a sudden we get we get kind of worried that we're going to be going down a road of well, oh, that's that's not Bible, that's psychology. Well, the Bible is psychology, <laughs> so let's not let's not be offended by that. Let's understand that what's the correct psychology that we're talking about. Okay, so the psychology of emotions is what we're talking about here. All right, I'll put these up here. And we'll talk about them a little bit. I think I got one more. Okay. Emotions are feelings that we give meaning to. What do I mean by that? They're feelings that we give meaning to. Sometimes there's feelings that we get, and we get them, but they don't really strike anything emotionally because they don't mean anything to us. Before I became a Christian, if you had said something to me out of the Bible, I may have had a feeling, of it, but emotionally it wouldn't have done anything to me because it didn't have any meaning to me, Right? But then when something is said to me that I have meaning, so if I am, if you come to me with a problem, with a family member, right? And, and, and you come to me and we can sit down, and since I am not emotionally attached to that family member, I can sit back and I can discuss it more logically than you can because you might be angry about it, you might be depressed about it, but I can sit back and talk to you about it and I may have feelings about it, but I'm not emotionally attached. And then I may have the exact same problem with a family member of mine, but I'm not gonna be the one that can fix it because now I'm what? I'm emotionally attached. So I have to go to somebody. So that's why the counselor can never fix his own family because the counselor is emotionally attached. He has to now go to somebody who's not emotionally attached to the situation. When I'm emotionally attached to a situation, sometimes I make very bad decisions. I'm gonna make a decision in the world of a drug addiction, enabling. If I enable, typically I am enabling a loved one to stay in their addiction because I love them. I tell parents all the time, I'm like, don't feel guilty about enabling your son or your daughter to use, you love them. But what you gotta do is get somebody else to step in there and help to limit your enabling. Because it's natural that you as a parent of a loved one are gonna enable. You think you're doing the right thing, but you can't think straight about it. I had a man come to me several years ago, and he walked in my office and he said, Todd, he goes, I have a son, he's 42 years old. He needs help with his addiction. I said, where is he? He said, he's living in a hotel in Warner Robins. And I looked at him and I said, now his wife is in there with me. And I looked at him, I said, who's paying for the hotel? He said, I am. I said, who's paying for his food? He said, I am. He said, but he won't get help. I said, why would he get help? He has no reason to change anything because you're paying for everything. I said, and you're doing that because you, you love him. However, now here's what you have to do. You have to go and you have to tell him, son, I love you. And because I love you, I will pay for the hotel for two more weeks, and I will pay for food for two more weeks, and after that, we're done, unless you get help. And his wife looked at him and said, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> now that was his, not his, it was not the son's real mother. So she was a little bit more disconnected, and she understood better what that son needed than what the father understood because he was emotionally connected to the son. He called me the next day and he said, my son is off to a program in South Georgia to get help. I said, that's all it took, right? All it took was me saying, me ste stepping in and saying, we're going to stop this. I love you, but we're going to stop this right here. Okay. So emotions are feelings that we give meaning to, and they can stir up anger, embarrassment, shyness, timidity, jealousy, happiness, fear, depression, worry, and we can go on and on. There's a lot of emotions out there, okay? Four components that we have to feeling and emotion, okay? So there's four components to feeling and emotion. Why something means something to you, okay? Number one is the situation you're in. What's happening to you at the moment? The situation you're in may stir up feelings, which would then relate you to an emotion, okay, of one of the, a number of different things. Number two is the details you pay attention to. Some people are gonna be more emotionally stirred up by a situation because they're more tuned into what's going on. 
my wife was always more tuned in to what was going on with my kids when they were little because I was gone all the time. So she's more emotionally attached. So therefore she would notice things that I wouldn't notice. Therefore she didn't understand why I didn't feel the same way about things that were happening with the kids as she did. Does that make sense? Because she was paying attention to more details than I was. Number three, the appraisal of what the situation means to you. What, is this, what, what does this mean to you? And depending on the situation, depending on the person involved, but to, depending on if it's at work or if it's uh, just a re recreational thing that you're doing or whatever the issue is, will stir up those emotions. And number four, there's your response, physical changes. I'm not mad. Well, your ears, your ears are red <laughs> and your palms are sweating, right? How many of us, how many of you have emotional responses like that to strong emotions? I do. Yeah. There's things, maybe you start to stutter or you start to sweat, right? And you might say to your spouse, well, I'm not mad. Well, you sure are red, right? They know you're mad because the physical changes are, are occurring. So, or behaviors. When, 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 I, when I'm stressed, I get real short tempered. And I have to recognize it about myself. When I get stressed, I get short-tempered. And I have to recognize that about myself. So when I come in the house, I've been working out in the yard all day and I've got something pressing on me and I walk in, and this happened to me just the other day. And I walk in and the little things that usually don't bother me, bother me. And one of the things that bothers me when I get stressed is if the trash can is overflowing and people are still shoving trash in it. <laughs> so immediately I come in and I'm stressed and I'm short tempered and I'm like, okay, if you see the trash can is full, empty it. Well, I have family members that didn't take that too well. Dishes in the sink. That's right. <laughs> dishes, dishes in the sink. I got a list. That's right. I've got to, I've had to learn what my issues are that trigger me, that get a response from me, and prepare myself for those things. Right? Preparation. 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 When you wake up in the morning, you put on the whole armor of what? That includes your emotions. I know what's going to anger me, right, Turbo? I know what's going to set me off. I've got to prepare my mind for that when the day begins. Before I get out of the bed, I already need to be thinking, okay, I need to be prepared. Putting on that whole armor of God mentally, spiritually, physically, all the way around. Okay? So questions on that. We're going to get a little more detail here as we go through this introduction. So is this where you get the counselor to try to correct that dishwasher and uh, <laughs> trash and that sort of thing? Because you can control your own emotions and understand yourself better in, in the way you respond. Right. But how do you fix the elephant in the room? Sometimes you don't. Yeah. I've learned that in my own family is, is I, I, I can't control anybody, but who? This is the only one I can control. And I've tried to control my wife. I try to control my adult kids, and it usually frustrates me and it makes them mad, and nothing gets done, and everybody's unhappy and I sleep on the couch. <laughs> we, don't, we don't like that. So I don't like sleeping with the dogs. I just, and they're, uh, and so, but you're, I, I've learned in my life that there's some things that I'm not gonna change. I'm not gonna change those things. So there, but, but I've learned that there's some things that I, I, I can express it, but it, I can't. And so I've got, to, I've got to tell myself it's okay. It's okay if the, if the sink is full of dishes and the dishwasher is empty. It's okay. And then when I get time, I'll put the dishes in the dishwasher. That's why she's laughing. She knows I'm going to come home and be like, it's right. okay. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> That's right. It, 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 Here's one that's the hardest I, thing. And going on that, I, I have to use this with my adult children, and I use it with my guys and whatnot. And so, uh, you know, we go through life, we learn these things, but uh, yeah, I explain 
I like the bed made every morning. Time Same here. I mean, it's a it's a big deal, right? Yeah. And then, but somebody else that may not be a big deal. And but instead of ranting and raving about why the bed's not made, right? Whoever left, or who, yeah, I make the bed. That's right. Yeah. And before long, somebody, your family, whoever, can look at that, whatever you're doing, and they learn more about the fact that it's important to you. And so yeah. one day when you don't do it, someone's more likely to do that because they know it's important to you. Right. So that they, they yeah. come in and do it. And right. That was a, I took most of my life to, to learn that. Maturity has a way of calming emotions sometimes, you know, and that's the advantage that some of us have <laughs> is just experience. And uh, but you can hope you can take that experience and pass it along to younger ones and say, you know, this is the way you this is the way you handle it. Um, getting angry and getting mad and getting upset. Now, may might I be angry because the bed's not made up? But do I have to respond in anger? The Bible says to be angry and James says to do what with anger, Turbo? Be quick to listen, slow, quick to, I'm slow to speak and slow to anger. So, so with my anger, shut this up, open these up, and slow to anger. Doesn't say don't be angry. But you got to take the anger and funnel it to where it's productive. Because in the moment, it's not productive. Now, there are times where in the moment, anger is appropriate. If somebody's assaulting your children, <laughs> your wife, right? In that moment, see, God designed your emotions. Do you believe that? Okay, and then the Bible then tells us how to properly use them. So he, he, God gave us anger. God gave you depression. God gave you anxiety. Now, we would go to the verses where we would say, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but the Bible is telling me that I'm going to be anxious. So he's telling me how to use the anxiety because some anxiety is healthy. We'll talk about that when we get to anxiety. Okay? Because some anxiety is healthy for you. It's good for you. Depression is actually good for you. So we have to be careful with the medicate. When we want to medicate depression away, we're actually getting in God's way sometimes. And we'll talk about that when we get to depression. So we'll just kind of touch on that, all right? The primary chemicals. Primary chemicals that drive emotions. It's, I got a little acronym, DOSE IN, all right? <laughs> this is your, this is, these are your primary your primary chemicals because you are a physical being, right? You are spirit, soul, and body. So it all works together. It all works together for God's glory. So the, the, the spiritual side of your emotions, God tells us how to handle those emotions, right? The soul side of my emotions is my mind, my will, and the emotions themselves. The body side of my emotions is my chemicals that are in my body, my brain, the input that comes in through my senses, right? So you're working, God's working all these things together to use your emotions to do some things in your life. God uses emotions to do some. We'll see what those things are in a few minutes, okay? So, the, so your, your first primary emotional chemical is dopamine. This is a motivating chemical. I call it, it's happy shots, right? It's a boost. It's your prior, it's instant gratification. It's your major force behind addiction. That's where we get the word dope from. Dopamine, right? So dopamine is your, it's the, it's the instant gratitude. Ooh, that made me feel good. You know, somebody comes up and says, Deanna, great job. Boom. You get a dopamine boost, right? Video games. 
Kids are addicted to video games because it's a huge dopamine rush. A like on a post. Dopamine rush. Now I'll talk in a few minutes, a few minutes about what how dopamine actually works in your body two different ways. Okay. Dopamine helps to balance you. And we'll see that in just a minute. Your, it runs through a system in your body. I call it the accelerator and the brake, right? You ever seen somebody who does that when they're driving? You know, they kind of, well, that's what your body is doing with dopamine to keep you balanced, okay? And we'll talk about that in a minute. So your next one, your next chemical is, is um, oxytocin, okay? It's a hugging or social chemical. Hey, buddy, how you doing, man? It's good to see you. You know, and somebody likes you. They, it's, a, it, it, it's how it makes me feel when my friend shows up. My best friend, we sold a house. My wife and I sold a little rental house yesterday. And, and this house, <laughs> There's nothing to it. It's two bedrooms, one bathroom. I've never seen somebody so excited to buy a two bedroom, one bath house in one Robins near the base of my life. But she's 80 years old and she bought the, ho- the, she bought the house right down the road from her best friend. That's the only reason she bought it. Best fr- their best fr- you, you should see them together. They're just, oh, they just love each other. They're, they're living on oxytocin that's 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 driving these ladies okay it's the it's a social chemical in your body friendships long lasting feelings it brings calm and safety when uh, you ever you ever given your dog a uh, a storm uh they call them like storm coats um what are they what are they? thunder shirts right because it makes it, it makes them feel comfortable it gives them that hugging feeling so it, it calms their anxiety, right? It calms their anxiety when the storms are coming and they wear those things and it, it, that's what they're operating on, okay? It's a social thing. They feel, my dog, my, my, my big dog, he's a, 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 a part poodle, part Labrador, part, yeah, he's a big dog, right? When he was a puppy, when he would get scared, he would go under the coffee table. And when he was a puppy, he was this big and he could go under it. Well, yesterday, something scared him and he tries to go under the coffee. He's like, boom, he's trying to go under the coffee. I'm like, you can't get under there, buddy. But it's tight for him, and he feels comfortable. He feels secure under there. Okay, and that's what this chemical is. It's, it, it's uh, building trust in relationships. When I feel, when, I feel uh, when I'm around people, I th- feel like I can trust. This chemical is produced in my body, okay? And it, and it, and it drives emotions. What's the next one? The next one is, this is the S, serotonin. Another social chemical, this is more pride, loyalty, status, recognition from others. Great job, man. You did a great job today at whatever you did, right? You did a great job at work. A lack of serotonin in our system causes tremendous OCD problems. It causes tremendous depression problems, anxiety problems. When we're low on serotonin, what are serotonin builders? Man, good to see you. Man, you did a great job. So if a person if a person feels worthless, what are they lacking? Serotonin. They need a boost. They need people to come along beside them and, 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 and lift them up. Tell them that they're proud of them, that they love them, that they care for them that you've done a great job. There's recognition. It motivates. This is people with high serotonin levels are strong leaders, strong leaders. All right. Um, it impacts your physical growth. All of these chemicals are going to impact your growth. Okay. And finally, endorphins. This is the runner's high. This responds to pain. Cold showers. Cold showers re- release endorphins. You jump in a pool when it's cold, it's going to, it, 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 it invigorates you. It, it wakes you up, right? It decreases stress. This running, this is why running is a great uh, uh, cure for depression. Get out, walk, exercise, do something. Get the, get the blood flowing. It releases those endorphins. It's a natural painkiller. Endorphins is a natural painkiller that can come along and man, you get out there, you walk, you got a headache, get up, go do something, the headache goes away. Okay? So there's God has put these things in your body to help you. We always want to turn to medication first. Sometimes we need to turn to these other things first. Encouragement from other. That's why God tells us to do what? Encourage one another. Lift one another up. 
come together as the body of Christ. We solve a lot of our emotional problems when we come together as the body of Christ. And the more you can come together, the better these things become. If you isolate yourself, you don't get a lot of these chemicals up in your body. Did you know when you go outside, when you go out, especially in the summertime, the springtime, even in the fall around here, the blues of the sky, the greens of the grass, and the purples and the yellows of the flowers work together in your brain to boost your, your chemicals in your body. Why do you get down on cloudy days? It's gray. And you're not getting the blue. You're not getting those colors coming into your body. Get out. If you're struggling with depression, get outside. Walk. Socialize. But what's the last thing I want to do? All right, the last thing I want to do is those things. So it takes some obedience to God to get out and go do those things. It boosts these chemicals in your body and it, and it, and it stimulates the brain activity. Adrenal we'll, we'll shorten this, we're just gonna call it adrenaline. <laughs> it's both a neurotransmitter and a hormone. Most of these are neurotransmitters and hormones, okay? Um, this is an important role in your body's fight or flight response as a medication. Neo, uh, I have a tough time saying that. It's used to increase and maintain blood pressure in short term serious health situations. Uh, adrenaline does what to us? Fight or flight. There's an emergency. If we were to come in here and yell fire, your adrenaline's going to pump up. And it gives you the strength and the energy to either fight the fire or you're gonna you're gonna run from the, you're gonna but it's gonna give you here's the problem in today's culture we are adrenaline junkies we are living on adrenaline right what happens when we live on adrenaline it wears your body out it wears your body out physically it wears your body out emotionally it wears your body out spiritually if you're living on adrenaline, if you're living on fear, if you're living in stress all the time, it's going to do those things to your body, okay? Next. All right, let's talk about dopamine for just a minute. Remember, we said this is kind of an introduction tonight. We just want to get an idea of what these chemicals are in our body that drive our emotions. Dopamine, dopamine in your body passes through two systems. It passes through what we call the limbic system and the mesocordial pathways and it provides a balance in your emotions and in your life, okay? I'll give you an example here in just a minute, all right? It's how you're created. It's like if you got one side of dopamine that runs through one part of your body that's the accelerator, and the other side that's the, the brake, right? And so all day long, your body, the dopamine in your body is doing this. All, it's, like a, it's like a teeter-totter. You know what a teeter-totter is? All right, seesaw, all right? You ever play on one of those on the playground? Right, you get the big fat kid on one end, and then you and you're the skinny kid, and it's stuck like this. Well, well, this does happen with dopamine. Okay, this can happen, right? So all day long, your body is pushing the gas and it's pushing the pedal all day long. And I'll give you an example of this. So this morning, my alarm clock goes off at six o'clock, and the dopamine on the on the on the good side is saying. Man, this pillow feels good. I think I just want to lay here all day. And I'm getting that shot of what? That happy shot from the dopamine going, stay in the bed, stay in the bed. You don't need to get up. It's okay. You know, you don't need to go to men's home. You can just, you know, forget those meetings you got today. Just stay in the bed all day, right? So that's what this side is telling me, right? And then the other side is going, if you don't get up, um, you're not going to get stuff you need to get done today. You might get fired by your boss. You can't be late again. I got to get that pavilion built over at Todd's house, right? <laughs> so all day long, this is what dopamine is doing in your body. It's doing this right here, okay? For the drug addict, the dopamine gets out of balance and we're operating in one mode all the time. So I tell this to guys when they come in the next step for the first month. For 30 days, when you're coming into your first 30 days at Next Step, this balance is like this. The fat kid's on one end, and the skinny kid's up here. And for 30 days, 
because it takes about 30 days for the body to do this. So for 30 days, they can't think straight. They're irrational. And then we wonder, why do they keep making that same decision over and over? It's because the chemicals in their body are so messed up. They're out of, they're out of whack. And it takes 30 days for the body to do what? Come back into balance. So it's kind of like this guy right here, right? They're, they're even, but then you got the big key, you know, and it just, you're so out of balance. Did you draw that one too? I did, yeah, you like that? Yeah, that's in my art class next week. So understand your, the, the chemicals in your body can get out of whack. The vast majority of the time, who causes the chemicals to get out of whack? We do. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through these different emotions, the, the, the sadness and depression. Most of the time, our chemical imbalances are caused by us. They're caused by us. Now, there are times when chemical imbalances are, are, are natural. They're medical. They're always all medical. But in the majority of the time, I have caused the problem, okay? The purpose of emotions. I'm going to put these up here. All right. Emotions are, whoop, let me back up here. First of all, they're indicators. If I get angry, ask yourself, why am I angry? If you're driving down the road and that red light comes on, it's a what? Stop. Indicator. It's the battery light. What's it telling you? I have an alternator problem. <laughs> the, the fuel light comes on. What's that mean? I need to get some gas. <laughs> the tire light comes on. What's that mean? It's tell those indicators, your emotions are usually telling you something's wrong or something's right. Most of the time it's telling me something's wrong, okay? So emotion, the first thing I gotta ask me, why am I feeling like this? What's causing me to feel this way? Remember we talked about those emotions earlier, how you look at this situation, what are the details you pay attention to? Why does this have meaning to you? Right? So usually it's telling you there's a problem. So it's an indicator. The first thing it should be an indicator for you to do is pray. The first thing it's an indicator to do is pray. If it's anger, pray. Depression, pray. Bitterness, pray. Embarrassment, pray. It, whatever it is, pray. Because what you're doing, remember the old adage, count to 10, count to 20, right? There's some truth to that. Because when you pray, it gives the chemicals in your body. First of all, you're engaging who? God. Second of all, so it's a spiritual issue because I'm going to God, my creator with it. But it's also a physical issue. I'm giving the chemicals in my body time to do what? Balance out. Balance out. That red face is red for a reason. The red ears, the shaking, it's happening for a reason, right? Those chemicals, you get butterflies in your stomach. You know why you get butterflies in your stomach? Because those chemicals are produced where? In your gut, right? And they're rushing to your brain and they're hijacking your brain. And that's when we make really bad decisions and we say things that we didn't mean. And we say things to our spouse that we shouldn't have said because my brain just gets hijacked by those, by those chemicals. I go to prayer, I'm engaging God. That's the most important thing. But the second most important thing is I'm giving that physical part of my being time to settle down. Does that make sense? So when you get upset, you get angry, first thing you're going to do is what? Pray. Does it take any special talent to pray? No. You don't have to go to a class for that. Just, just start praying. All right. So yeah, it's an indicator. Secondly, it indicates what your values are. Some of you are going to get upset about things and some of you aren't because you don't value that thing, right? So it indicates to you what your values are. It, it, it tells you that there might be an action or a decision that has anxiety. A lot of times anxiety means there's an action or a decision I have to make. If I got a test tomorrow and I haven't studied for that test, I'm going to get anxious. It's telling me I got to study. I got to do something. It causes me to think, reflect, and evaluate. Emotions increase wisdom. Emotions, emotions 
emotional event caused me to take a picture in my mind at that moment in time and evaluate and recall those things, right? Strong emotional events you're going to remember because your body, your brain is going to, boom, takes a picture, boom, this is what happened. And those emotional events stick in your mind, whether they're good or bad. It increases wisdom. It, it, it rewards, it help, the emotions, feeling good about something is a reward and it helps me build, man, I want to do this again and I want to do this again and I want to do this again if it's a good thing. All right, it, builds, it can build healthy habits. Emotions are there for you to build healthy habits, not bad habits. We can do both though. Emotions reset us. One of the main purposes of depression is to reset your brain. Depression is there to help you reset the brain. And whatever situation you're in, whatever's going on, the depression will come in there and it helps you to reevaluate. My, my family for the last two months, three months, has been going through a lot. We've lost my grandmother the other day. We lost my father-in-law two months ago. We've had two babies, grandbabies born. One of them's been in and out of the hospital with a lot of problems, a lot of emotional issues, a lot of things. A lot, of, you know, we've just been, man, okay. And it causes you to reflect, think, what's important, and it helps you to reset in your brain and, and think about those things. And finally, it forms the brain. Those, neuro, those, those chemicals are also neurotransmitters. So those neurotransmitters are what help to develop your brain. And in young children, that is huge. So if there's things in a young child's life that are emotionally terrible, neglect, abuse, all of those things in a young child's life, what's that doing to his brain? The number one cause of schizophrenia is childhood neglect and abuse. They're not born with it. It's developed. And they learn that. And it sets that brain in. That's why the Bible says, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way. It doesn't say train up a grown man. It's train up a child because that's their most critical time. A child's most critical time of brain development is between zero and three. Zero and three. And by the time they're 13, if you haven't been poured into them, they're pretty much done. If you haven't, somebody else has. That's right. It's, not, it's one thing to keep them in church. It's another thing to live it out at home. That's where it takes place, in that home. you got to teach it and live it in that home because emotionally... We are doing our children a great disservice if we're not pouring into these children. I started reading the Bible to my children in the womb <laughs> when they were <laughs> inside there, right? I'm reading the Bible to them. Now, do they understand it? No, but I'm getting the, they're getting them in the habit of hearing that over and over and over again. So we are, we are more emotion than logic. A lot of us like to think we're logical. Here tonight, you're going to remember 6% of what I tell you. And you're going to remember 94% of how you felt. This is research. This is 10 years of research that was done several years ago uh, by a guy named uh, David Barden. He's got a book out there called The Perfect Plan. And The Perfect Plan was a, was a sales book. It was a book to, to discover why people buy things. But in that, they did a lot of brain research as to why people buy things. And they say people buy things emotionally, not logically. Even the most logical people think that they are logical, they're really emotional. He said what he discovered is that almost 94% of the time, you're going to buy something because you emotionally connect to a person. Not because you need it. <laughs> Only 6% of what, you, what I say from here tonight you will remember. But you will remember 94% of how you felt when you left here. A great public speaker makes you feel a certain way. 
you're not going to remember anything. I shouldn't say anything, but most of the time, you're not going to remember what pastor preached on Sunday morning. But you're going to say, man, he's a good preacher because he makes you feel a certain way. Right? He draw he pastor can he's a good public speaker. He can draw you, he draws you in with the illustrations and he draws you in with how he presents the word. I don't remember what he preached on Sunday. Now I go back to my notes. I can go back. I took notes. That's why I take notes, because that's that's the way we go back and, and learn that. But I'm not gonna remember what he preached on all the time, but I know it was good. You know, I don't remember what I had last week for lunch, but I know I ate. <laughs> right? I I know I ate. <laughs> So you're gonna remember, so in our decision making, in our decision making, you're gonna, de- you're gonna decide, 85% of the time you're gonna decide on emotions. 15% of the time, Chad just built a pavilion for me. He didn't build that pavilion because I needed it. He built, I, he built it, cause it made my, because it made my wife happy. And if it made my wife happy, it made, it made me happy, right? <laughs> I didn't need it. Looks good. It looks good. Yeah, everybody loves it. If you need a pavilion bed or a deck, this guy, a fence, whatever, man, that's the guy right there. So, yeah, that's right. It's, emo- it was, it's, emo- it's emotional. Welcome to my world. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Real quick, we got a few minutes here. I wanna, I'm gonna share this real quick. In Second Corinthians, we're not gonna turn there. Second Corinthians chapter one. Paul, Paul, Paul lays out Second Corinthians chapter one, and he's talking about he's 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 making this case to the Corinthians church, and he says this. He says, he says everything I've been through, I've been through, so I can t- I can teach you, and you can learn from what I've been through. And then he talks about those things that he, and how, how, how terrible those things were. And he gets to verses 8, 9, and 10, and he says, The things were so bad for me, he said, that I had this sentence of death in me, that I just wanted to die. So what's Paul's emotional state at that point? Discouragement, <laughs> depression. I don't think he's suicidal, but I think he's to the point where you're like, Lord, if you take me... <laughs> I'm okay with that. Right, right, yeah. That was my grandmother who just passed away. She's kind of, when I saw her last year, she's like, if the Lord were to take me, I'm okay with that, right? And I don't think she's going to kill herself, but, you know, she's, she's like, I'm ready to go. But this Paul's, emo- so Paul's emotional state, he finally, he gets to the point in the verses 9 and 10, he says, I got to the point that I could not trust myself. So he recognized in his strong emotional state, he cannot trust who? himself. You've got to recognize that. That there's times in your emotional state that you cannot trust. But then he makes this statement. But he says, so I turn my trust to the one who raises the dead. So at that point, he says, I know that if I was going to come out of the situation I was in, I had to get my focus off of me and put it on the one who raises the dead because me is saying I just want to die. So I had to take it up here. And then he tells the Corinthian church, he says, now I went through this so that I could turn around and help you. You're going to go through emotional things so you can turn around and help somebody else. And if you don't go through it, you can't help somebody else. You can't. You have to go, you have to go through it. It matures you, it makes you stronger, it builds your value system, it makes you a better person, it resets your brain, it does all these things. These emotions are doing all these things for you because God designed it that way, right? So then I look at Jesus in Luke chapter 22, and we won't go there and I'll just paraphrase it here. Luke chapter 22, Jesus is coming out of the upper room with the disciples. He's getting ready to go to the cross. He goes down to the Garden of Gethsemane as he has been doing every day, the Bible says. He's been going down there every day to pray. And he tells the disciples, he says, stay here and pray for what? Pray that you would not be led into temptation. 
And then he, Bible says he goes a stone's throw away and he gets down on his knees and he says, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will. What did Paul do? Not me, but Paul follows the same pattern, doesn't he? Paul follows a, the Apostle Paul follows the same pattern here. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but completely dependent on the Father. On his knees, he's praying this prayer, and then the Bible says what? He starts to sweat drops of blood. Why does he sweat drops of blood? Stress. Stress. Anxiety. Pressure. The cross is coming. Separation from the Father is coming. That's the issue, isn't it? The issue is there's going to be a break in the Trinity that has never occurred in history. A break in the Trinity. Think about that. A break in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit Trinity. Never occurred in history. It will never occur again. But I'm sure Jesus, before he's going to the cross, is going, oh my, I'm going to be separated from God the Father. And he is sweating drops of blood. And what happens? How how is it resolved? What's God the Father do? Not now. Sends an angel to do what? To strengthen him. He doesn't take it away from him. See, we like to pray to, oh God, please take this away. Please, just take it away. Please. God's like, I'm taking it away. I'm not taking your depression away right now. I'm not taking your anxiety away. I've given you a way to deal. I've given these things to you. I've told you in my word how to deal with them. And God the Father comes, brings an angel, comforts him, strengthens him. So emotions, strong emotions are times for God to do what to us? Strengthen us. They're there for God to strengthen complete. I had a lady, I'll close with this. I had a lady several years ago come to me. Her pastor sent her to me. It's when I was on staff here at the church. And her pastor sent her to me. He said, Todd, he goes, I have a lady in my church that I have, she's, 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 she struggles with depression. She's on medication. She's this, she's that. I don't, I, I don't know what to do. I've counseled with her. I don't know what to do. Could you help me talk to her? So I, she came up here. Her and her husband came up to the church one day. And we talked for a little bit. And I, and I looked at her and I said, um, I, I forget what her name was. Sarah. I don't know what it was. I wouldn't give you her real name anyway, right? But Sarah, I said, Sarah, have you ever considered that God's got a calling on your life. And just like he gave Paul that thorn in the flesh to show that his grace was sufficient. I said, you've tried everything. You've tried medication, you've tried counseling, you're trying this and all that. I said, have you ever tried just drawing up closer to Jesus? And I'm not saying you haven't been. I said, but you ever thought that God's got something special for you? And he's allowed this depression in your life because he wants you to draw closer to Jesus than me or anybody else in this room or in this church. I said, he is drawing you in and he's drawing you in and he's drawing you in and he's using this depression to make you come up closer than any of us in this room will ever have to get. I said, I don't know if that's the answer. I said, I don't know. I said, but I would consider that. And about a month later, that pastor called me. He said, I don't know what you said to her. He said, but she's a new woman. And he said, all she does is spend time in the Word of God and serving like nobody's ever served in my church. And and she'll still struggle, not as much, but her depression was starting to what? Slowly go away. Sometimes we don't know what God's doing through our emotions. I had a phone call today from a friend of mine. And he said, Todd, he goes, I think I need to come to the next step. He's my age. And he told me what was going on. He's crying on the phone. And I got his wife on the phone because I could hardly understand him. And I said, I said her name. 
Sarah. <laughs> I said, Sarah, let me tell you something. He's running. God's got a call on his life. I know it. I've known him for a long time. And I said, he's running. He won't surrender. And I said, and he needs to surrender. I said, his problem is not pot. His problem is not all the things he's... I said, his problem is he's running from God. I said, next step ain't going to fix him. Surrender is going to fix him. I said, I'll take him in. I'll bring, yeah, he's meeting with Chris in the morning. I said, come on. I said, but his issue is surrender. He's already been through a program. He knows. He's been doing good. But he had a few little hiccups and a little, few little things in his life. And he told me today, he said, I'm angry and I'm bitter. So he told me on the phone today, strong emotions. And if I don't, and any of us can get there. Any of us can get there. Me included. Any of us. So questions, that's, I'm going to close. We're right about at 8 o'clock, so I want to, I want to close this up tonight. Any questions you got? Todd, I got something I'd like to get your opinion on. Uh, at our old church, we taught youth for about 11 years, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. And I used to teach them that in most every situation in life, you're either going to react, and I use that word react intentionally, you either will react in the flesh or you will respond in the spirit. Right. And it's going to depend on your emotions. As to what you think. Yeah. Do, you, do you agree with that? Yeah. God has given those as emotions. Now my, my, now I have to choose, am I going to do what God says to do with my emotions? Anger. Let's take anger. Right? Anger. God says with my, my James, is, James 1 is my solution. Right? Be slow to speak. Quick to listen. Slow to slow to anger. Slow to wrath. Right? There's my, there's my pattern. Right? Doesn't mean that I cannot now use my anger to address the situation, right? But now I've calmed down. So you're right. It's am I gonna respond or am I gonna react? react? Am I gonna blow up? Right? Or am I gonna respond correctly? And God gives us I, whenever I'm dealing with depression, I always take him to Second Corinthians chapter one. Let's look at Paul's depression. Let's look at Jesus' anxiety. We, well, Jesus' anxiety? Yeah, Jesus' anxiety. Because he was 100% man. So anxiety is not a sin. Right? Depression is not a sin. God gave it to you. He gave it to you. Now he tells you how to use it. It's a tool. Yeah, sometimes it's tools we don't like. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. The other day I had to fix my lawnmower. I used a hammer and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only tool I know. <laughs> I think it's um, interesting how the Bible describes when we respond in the flesh. You know, that's really telling on how you know, we respond to the chemical reactions to the body. Yeah. You know, the body, you know, makes our brain want to do things, but we have to fight that with the spirit yeah. um, and see what our body's trying to make us do and to fight that off. That's right. Yeah. I, it's not easy. And God never said it was easy. He never said it was easy. A lot of times I'm looking for an easy way out. I don't want to be depressed, so I'm going to medicate. Right? I am not opposed to medication. I, I'm all for medication because it's going to save somebody's life. If, if they're so suicidal and they, then it's going, to, it's going to save their life, let's get them so they can now hear because a lot of times they can't even hear. I had a daughter. I have a daughter, but I have a daughter who was very, very suicidal. And medication was what we needed. But it's got to be coupled with counseling, godly counseling. It can't just be medication for medication's sake. It's got to be coupled with, with truth, right? Again, the brain is a funny machine up here. And it can get out of whack, just like I can break an arm. If I break my arm, I'm going to go to the doctor. And I'm going to get a cast. I'm not going to say, hey, just trust God. It'll be all right. No, I'm going to go get a cast on it. <laughs> but why do we want to do that with the brain sometimes? You know, it's funny. We want to do that with the brain sometimes. And, and, we, uh, and there's times where medication is appropriate. Sometimes there's times when medication might be 
hindering us. It's hard to tell when that is. So no matter what, if you decide to go the medication route, it's got to be coupled with what? Counseling. It has to be. Has to be. Because it's, it's, it's the whole package there. So that's why I say if you're going to a doctor who's only medicating you and he's not getting you to counseling, there, you need to find another doctor. So, one more question. Anybody, one more question? One more? Okay. Well, good. Well, good. We'll pick it up next week. We'll talk a little bit about depression and we'll talk a little bit about sadness. They all kind of go together, right? And we'll, uh, we'll go from there. I'm glad you're here tonight and I hope this was a help to you. And uh, again, just the introduction and we'll pick it up there next week. And uh, we will continue to videotape these as well. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your love for us. Thank you for um, thank you for emotions. Lord, we thank you for the emotions that you've given us, Lord. Um, they, don't, they don't come from the devil. They don't come from anything else. We just, we just got to learn how you say to handle them, how you say we're to respond to them, how you say that they bring benefit to us, Lord. We thank you for that. Sometimes we don't like the way that we feel with these, with these emotions. We don't like the way that, that uh, uh, how our bodies respond or how our minds are responding. Uh, and, and that gets uncomfortable in our lives, Father. But you're doing something through these emotions and these feelings um, that you've given to us. And I pray that we will allow these things to be the indicators and the growth that we need in our lives to help us along. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for our session. If you or a family member or anybody you know needs further help from us, please contact us at www.nextstepmen.org.